gentlemen. Perhaps uh, you can take uh, your seats and uh, we'll start the next session. And I would like to call my other colleagues on to the stage. Dr. Wanazman is coming on board. Dr. Wasan, uh, I do need to see Paul Ong. Dr. Ho, would you like to come up? Dr. Jaya and um, Dr. Randall, right? Okay, so I think we'll need to start. Um, Elia, can I start? Yep. Okay, this is a session on drug coated balloon, which is um, sponsored by B. Brown, Leave Nothing Behind, DCB Only Strategy, and How DCB Evidence Has Changed uh, Today's Practice. So I don't have any conflict of interest. The learning objectives are three. Firstly, is to be updated on the latest international DCB consensus group recommendations. Second, is to receive an insight into the latest clinical data and experience on DCB-only PCI. Third, is to learn how DCB can be a safe or safe option in managing complex PCI. These are uh, the people who are going to be involved. I'm chairing this meeting with uh, Dr. Paul Ong from Singapore, Wan Azman and Wasan, Malaysia and Thailand, respectively, and scientific program, a lecture on international consensus group guidelines by Dr. Ho Hiwa, and case presentation of uh, DCB in CT uh, CTO lesion by Dr. Jaya, and in complex PCI by Dr. Lo from Singapore. So I hope uh, you will enjoy this. It's only 45 minutes uh, session, so we hope to gain as much as possible uh, from this uh, uh, in the session. So firstly, I would like to call on Dr. Ho Hiwa to present on the lecture on uh, international consensus group guidelines uh, in, I think it was in 2018, I think. All right. Hiwa. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, B. Braun and uh, uh, AICT Asia PCI for inviting me to talk about the international uh, DCB consensus uh, uh, guidelines. Uh. So my task today is to highlight the key points of the uh, consensus uh, paper. I have no uh, conflict of interest to declare. So as you can see, the third report of the International DCB Consensus was published in uh, JACC in 2020. And uh, it comprises of a, a panel of uh, European experts as well as uh, the Asian uh, KOL. The uh, report is necessary because it provides uh, an important update on the previous recommendation. And this is based on uh, a lot of the uh, clinical trials that has arisen uh, over the past five years. So I think we're all aware that drug-coated balloon began in 2006 when uh, Professor Bruno Scheller and colleagues started using DCB uh, way back in 2006 for instant restenosis. And how does the drug-coated balloon work? I mean, for, Earth, for um, most of us who are familiar, we know that uh, it is a balloon that is coated with a drug, and you deliver it to the disease segment. And upon a single balloon inflation, the drug is transferred to the vessel wall, and it exerts its anti effect. And the unique thing about this is that uh, it's only a single application, and uh, this is the concept of a local drug delivery. And the beauty is this, that you do not have any metallic implant, so you do not have any stand-related uh, complications. There are many DCB uh, in the market, but uh, what is uh, important is uh, uh, we have to be aware that the Plaquetaxel is the drug of choice in majority of the DCBs. And you can, this is because the Plaquetaxel is quite lipophilic and you have a very fast uh, acute drug transfer. And you can see that from the uh, various uh, available uh, Plaquetaxel DCBs, uh, the concentration is about 2 to 3.5. But what is different from each company is the excipient, or what is called the carrier. So you have different carriers uh, carrying the drug. And of course now we have the Limus-based DCBs. So Limus is not very effective in terms of drug transfer, but uh, the companies have come up with their own uh, special technology to facilitate uh, the drug transfer. But one, you can appreciate that uh, because of the different uh, excipients, different release kinetics, uh, you can, uh, one can say that you cannot assume that one DCB uh, results can be transferred to the other. So I think important for us to appreciate that there is no class effect of DCBs. Uh. So that is why you see uh, sometimes a mixed results in some of the uh, clinical trials. 
Uh, the other important thing about DCB is uh, it comes to lesion preparation. I think uh, we know that it involves two steps. So a lot of times we do uh, lesion preparation. I would say that 95% of the time we, we prepare the lesion. And the final step is the uh, delivery of the drug with the DCB. And the uh, consensus group has come up with the latest recommendation, as you can see, on how we prepare the lesion. So for uncomplicated lesion, we use a standard balloon. For more complicated, we may use a specialty balloon like scoring balloon. And they have uh, recommended a balloon to vessel ratio of 1 to 1. The old recommendation was 0 0.8 to 1. So with the new recommendation, it's 1 to 1. And with uh, very calcified lesions, uh, you have to use uh, things like rotablation and lithotripsy. <laughs> so after you prepare the lesion, uh, the, you have to have a good flow, no flow limiting dissection, and residual stenosis of 30% or less. Then you can uh, decide that a patient can benefit from DCP as the final step. And you know that they have incorporated the use of FFR uh, to assess your lesion or whether it is suitable for DCB, and the cutoff use is uh, uh, more than 0.8. Uh, sorry, less than 0.8, uh, you can't use uh, DCB. Yeah? But despite the uh, new recommendations, uh, we are still using the old classification of dissection. This is a 30-year-old uh, pre-stand uh, classification of dissection, still very useful in our daily practice. So anything A and B, it is uh, safe to leave alone, but beyond that, you have to do the uh, bailout stenting. So the DCB was first used in uh, instant restenosis. Uh, so I'm just going to focus on uh, the clinical data. You can see from this table that there's many trials evaluating the use of DCB in uh, ISR, starting from bare metal ISR and DES ISR. And uh, the studies have shown that uh, DCB is equivalent to DES, especially for bare metal ISR. But when it comes to DES, ISR, I think uh, DCB may be a little bit less effective. And uh, the DCB has received uh, class one indications for the treatment of ISR for both bare metal and drug eluding stent. But I think important points to note is that DES, ISR is a very challenging group to treat. So what is important is to do imaging uh, to elucidate the cause of stand failure. For many of us who are DCB believers, we think it's a very good option because we don't want to, uh, uh, we don't want to put in an extra layer of stent. And we can always repeat the procedure and we can avoid things like uh, late stand thrombosis. Uh, and we may need to be a bit more aggressive in our lesion preparation. And the second lesion subset is the de novo disease. And increasingly, there's a lot of data to support the use of DCB in small vessels. The definition of small vessels is less than 3 mm. And I would like to highlight the uh, Basket Small 2 trial. This was the largest RCT uh, evaluating the use of DCB versus DES. And it shows that at 12 months, it was non-inferior uh, compared to the contemporary DES. And the result is sustainable at three years. And uh, DCB has also been evaluated in other uh, indications like acute MI. This is the revelation study in uh, the STEMI group. Although the numbers are small, uh, you can see that uh, uh, it is important to prepare the lesion. So in EMI, if you have thrombus, you have to perform a thrombosuction and followed by the pre-dilatation and the final step will be the DCB. Again, it shows that the clinical endpoints at nine months in terms of heart endpoints and the FFR at nine months was non-inferior. It is also assessed in the NSTEMI group in the PEPCAT uh, uh, NSTEMI study, and the uh, results were non-inferior. DCB was also evaluated in the high bleeding risk group of patients. This is the debut trial that was published in The Lancet in 2019. And what it shows that uh, DCB uh, versus bare metal stand with one month DAPT uh, showed not only non-inferiority but superiority uh, at nine months of follow-up. In terms of large vessels, I think uh, th this is a table showing you the uh, subgroup analysis. And it shows that the use of DCBs in large vessels is feasible and safe. But at this moment of time, uh, RCT data is lacking. So I think a lot of people are embarking on RCT uh, in large vessels. And we hope to have the uh, results uh, in the next two to three years' time. 
So there's a lot of, uh, uh, again, DCB is found to be useful in coronary bifurcation, but uh, again, the strong RCT data is lacking. For diabetes mellitus, a uh, very uh, important area of interest, especially in Southeast Asia. Uh, we have some small studies to suggest that it is useful, but again, we need a strong data from randomized control trial. And finally, uh, is there any concern in terms of mortality after we use uh, DCB? So this is a meta-analysis uh, of 28 RCTs involving 4,600 patients. And what it shows that uh, we can be assured that you know, the use of DCB is not associated with increased mortality because that has been suggested by the uh, meta-analysis in the peripheral arteries. But that has been uh, uh, debunked recently. So I'm going to finish my talk by sharing a, a case. This is a patient with a mid-LAD lesion presented with n STEMI, And you can see that when we use a 2.5 mm balloon, it is not dilatable. And we proceeded to do an uh, orbital arteriectomy with six runs, and we were able to crack the calcium. And uh, we again did the lesion preparation with a score flex. We got a stand light result after that. And we used a DCB 3520, and that is the final result. So is it sustainable? So patient had a CT angel at 12 months follow-up, and you can see that the LED is uh, widely patent. So in conclusion, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think DCB is a great therapeutic option for patients with coronary artery disease. The beauty of it is you leave nothing behind. And the key thing is to do a very good lesion preparation. And we can see that there are expanding indications beyond ISR, especially for the de novo, uh, ACS, high bleeding risk patients. Uh, I think it's just a matter of time uh, it's going to receive a class 2A indications for de novo disease. Uh. We know that it's a crowded market, but we have to uh, be aware that not all DCBs are equal. For the serolimus DCBs, I think uh, we need more data on its uh, safety and efficacy. Uh, thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you. Um, I think uh, we'll take uh, the questions towards the end. Uh, so we move on. I think, the, I mean, the, the indication for ISR is very clear. It's a class one indication. No one likes to put in another stand. But really, the money is with the dedum of lesions, especially with that uh, vessel. And that's uh, where uh, a lot of uh, interest is. And we are hopefully going to get answers, as he was saying, the next two years or so. Um, so let's give some examples where DCB may be useful uh, or can be useful in complex lesions. So for the first uh, presentation will be a case presentation by Dr. Jaya in uh, DCB in CTO lesions and he's from IGN of Malaysia. Thank you, Dato. Uh, thank you for uh, inviting me uh, this morning. So I, I'm Jaya, as Dato mentioned, uh, from the National Heart in Malaysia. So I'm tasked to share with you some cases uh, where we use DCB only uh, in CTO lesions. So <coughs> why, why DCB in CTO? So uh, DS increases the risk of diffuse restenosis. As you know, in CTO, most of the time you have to use very long stents, um, uh, and sometimes it's a full metal jacket. Yeah, uh, and. Uh, and in, a, in an acute CTO, sometimes sizing may be difficult. When you just open the vessel, you don't really know the size, uh, even if you use imaging. And there's a chance that you may occlude side branches, and there's a good chance for shorter DAPT in the realm of uh, 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 high bleeding risk. So there have been uh, some papers on CTOs, uh, not big numbers, of course. Um, uh, uh, this one by uh, Bruno Shalin Gang, 34 patients, uh, de novo CTOs. 80% uh, success rate, uh, good late lumen gain, and s significant improvement in Gina. Uh, and, and this uh, uh, UK paper, 44 CTOs, 6.8% um, uh, TLR, 2.3% uh, non-target vessel, non-STEMI, and MACE was about 9.8%. 9, 9 Again, Prof. Shin uh, and Group, uh, 93 uh, uh, de novo CTOs, late lumen loss was about 0 0.03, and um, at follow-up, uh, target vessel was uh, larger. MACE was 16.7%, but mainly driven, uh, driven by TBR, which is compared to, comparable to other CTO papers. Uh, 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 in my center, we, we do use a lot, of CT, uh, a lot of DCBs, and the number has uh, increased 
um, uh, greatly. Uh, I think right now we are doing uh, 1,000 over um, DCBs a year. Uh, this is not the latest paper. We did publish um, uh, our experience with uh, DCB and CTO. Um, almost 75% uh, were de novo lesions. Um, uh, uh, mean DCB size was 2.6. Uh, only 1.1% needed bailout sending, and maze was 2.3%, mainly driven by TLR. So let me share with you a few cases very quickly. 36-year-old gentleman, preserved LV function, uh, presented with um, recurrent angina with a negative troponin. Um, if you can appreciate that he had a total occlusion uh, of the proximal LED, uh, minor disease in the RCA circ was fairly clean. So uh, uh, not a very difficult CTO to cross, uh, just a fielder. Uh, and sequential pre uh with a semi-compliant and scoring balloon. Um, my default intention these days are to use a DCB. So I, I tend to use a lot of scoring balloons um, um, from the offset. Because uh, if, if my pre dilatation is good, I'm happy. I don't have flow-limiting dissections. I, I, a lot of times, I just put a DCB. So hence why uh, I, you know, I, I go ahead and use the scoring from the beginning. It, it's a little expensive, but um, um, if I can avoid a stand, I'm quite happy. So. A kit result looks quite quite good, so I put uh, we put a DCB in the uh, diagonal, uh, another long DCB in the LAD, um, and I was quite happy with the acute results. Some dissections uh, brought brought this gentleman back after about eight months, and you can see how beautiful the uh, lumen gain was. So avoided a stand in this very young gentleman. Um, uh, however, he still he still is an antiplatelet. I don't think any of us would dare take off his antiplatelet, but he he's doing very well. Um, so um, uh, another case: a 56-year-old gentleman uh, presented with a non-ST elevation MI, um, diffuse disease in the LED uh, and the OM, totally occluded right, but uh, obviously. Um, we thought it was a soft lesion, but I had to upgrade uh, to a fielder to cross it, uh, pre-dilated as usual, uh, and then we use scoring balloons uh, um, uh, 2025, 30. Um, after pre-dilatation, still not happy. Uh, did a little bit more work in the RPL. Um, was quite happy with the acute results. So we put in uh, three, uh, two two long DCBs, 2.5. Um, uh, it, this was a hybrid, sorry. I mean, we put a DCB in the distal and then we, we stented the proximal because uh, I was not too happy with the dissections. Um, and the acute results, mm, acceptable. Uh, uh, flow was 2.5. Two, two <laughs> anyway, uh, brought him back to restudy about six weeks later and, and you can see how beautiful the DCB treated section was. Maybe if, if, if I was a little bit more daring, I could have DCB the whole thing. Um, but it was a non STEMI, so I decided to stand the proximal. Um, well, the last case, Dr. Rosli, I promise. 64 <laughs> uh, year old gentleman with non STEMI, um, uh, occluded uh, LED. Uh, the other two vessels were mainly preserved. Um, again, uh, not a very difficult CTO. Uh, uh, sequential pre this one was a sequentially predilated with semi-compliant balloons. Um, uh, quite happy with the acute results. Uh, decided not to put a stand. Put two long DCBs, so 2.2540, uh, 2.540, uh, and and the results were very good. Uh, unfortunately, I did not have a restudy for him yet, uh, and so. DCB and angio, ang, uh, DCB angioplasty is safe, uh, whether it's uh, uh, in CTO, uh, whether it's a de novo or ISR. I mean, everybody has pointed out that in ISR is a class one indication. Hopefully, when in two years when we have our large vessel uh, de novo study, uh, we can prove that you know uh, what we have known all the while. But DCB is quite safe. Um, um, thank you. Thank you, Jill. Before I pass over to Dr. Paul to introduce the second uh, uh, presenter, please 
feel uh, you know please uh, participate with us ask questions on the net uh, on online so at least uh, we can try to answer your questions during this uh, session paul okay i i think in, you know we'll move on to our next speaker thank you very much once again uh, dr jai uh, katan so uh, it's a real honor to invite my colleague uh, Dr. Randall Lowe to give the next talk. Um, Randall is going to talk to us and share some, some example of DCB use um, in uh, complex PCI. Randall uh, is the consultant interventionist at uh, Tantoxing Hospital and Woodland Hospital in Singapore. So over to you, Randall. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Dr. Paul, for the kind introduction and a quick thank you to AICT and also to B. Brown for this session um, and to everyone here who is spending your Friday morning with us. I have no um, conflicts, and today I'm talking about DCV in complex lesions, and admittedly, this is a group with a uh, few pieces of evidence, so I'll probably be focusing more on some cases that we've done, because uh, I think that's what everyone is more interested in, and I'll try and wrap up with addressing some typical concerns that I hear um, for people who are trying to perform DCV for complex lesions. Now, so let's just start off with a very quick warm-up since it's early in the morning. Uh, if you could just by a very quick show of hands. Now, who stands by default and only uses DCB for cases that you don't want to stand? Anyone? Okay, so there's a reason why you're here in this session. Um, if anyone considers whether DCB is suitable for all your cases? You actively consider? Yeah, some hands. Do you actively consider intravascular imaging to guide your DCB cases as frequently as stands? Okay, more hands. And finally, you are confident that your DCB cases have good short and long-term outcomes. Yeah, okay. So what we know about DCB, uh, I won't spend much time on this. You've heard Dr. Ho mention about the international consensus. DCB works very well in ISR and small vessels, quite well in ACS, diabetic patients, and definitely for HBR. But what is less clear for now is how about all these other lesion subsets? Let's start with large vessel disease. Um, this is just one piece of evidence. Uh, it's a fairly recent paper, and they, they've shown that for large vessel disease, um, all the, the indicators, including MACE and including MI cardiac death, is actually non-inferior. In fact, there's a trend towards favoring DCBs. This is one case that we've done. It's a 78-year-old male. He has a known bladder tumor that was pending surgery, but before that could happen, he came in with NSTEMI, uh, EF 20%. This was in the COVID era. So um, this is the coronary angiogram, and you can see that uh, he actually has multi-vessel disease. And we had a heart team discussion because this generally would have been a surgical case. But because of all the other issues, the urology issue, the COVID, the, the consensus was let's fix the RCA, let's leave the LED CTO alone, settle the bladder issue, and then come back look, to look at the LED. So we did an IVUS to the RCA. What the IVUS told us was what kind of vessel size and what kind of morphology and strategy we'll be dealing with. Um, the vessel size was about 4+, plus. so we did a, a sequential dilation with a cutting balloon and an NC balloon, and finally did a 4 ODCB, and this is our final result. So what happened is he successfully underwent bladder surgery one month later. Turned out it was malignant, and he also had some lung lesions. So retrospectively, definitely a HBR patient and was a good choice for a DCB. Okay, so how about bifurcation lesions? Now, this is a um, table for a subset of evidence, and bifurcation lesions, the evidence is very mixed because we're talking about stents versus DCB's hybrid strategies or DCB-only strategy in the main branch and side branch. Uh, these are um, the studies that have con considered DCB-only, whether it's versus POBA or um, stents. So this is a 92-year-old patient, um, good premorbid, presents with STEMI, and we brought her to the lab. And we see that the culprit is actually a mid-LED and also a diagonal that was occluded. After probing the lesion open, we realized that we were dealing with a LED D1 bifurcation, a Bandina 011. And this is a very elderly lady, 92-year-old, so also falls squarely in the HBR category. Um, sequential dilations to the diagonal, to the LED, and this was the final result that we got. And she's still doing very well. Now, we, uh, we have gotten quite confident in our DCB results, so we've stopped doing routine relooks a long time ago. So unfortunately, for some of these cases, we don't have uh, some of the longer follow-ups to show you, which would have been good, um, but most of them clinically, we definitely follow them up. Now, for this patient, she actually complained of chest pain on day four when she was still in the ward. So we had a reason to do a relook, and everything was fine. Now, you can see that for the proximal diagonal, there was a type B coronary dissection, which is absolutely safe to leave behind, and that's what we did. 
Now, how about calcified lesions? Um, this is a very recent paper in 2023 where they took a small population of patients with very calcified lesions, did ROTA and then a complete BCB strategy and showed that there was no statistical difference uh, from patients who received stents. Now, this is our experience. Elderly patient, male patient, comes in with angina with abnormal stress echo. And on the right-hand side, very calcified vessel with tandem lesions. And even angiographically, you can appreciate that uh, there's calcium columns on both sides of the vessel. So we decided to go with an upfront rota strategy, uh, five runs, and then do a sequential dilation. But even with an NC balloon, the proximal balloon wasn't expanding well. So IVUS, concentric calcium rings, a good case for I IVL, which is what we did. So we carried on with an IVL 2.5. And after that, much better lumen gain. Followed up with further post dilations. Uh, you can see gut extensions, pulling out all the equipment that we have. And finally, wrapped up with a 2.5 uh, and then a 3.0 DCB um, in basically the entire vessel, three different sizes in the proximal, the mid, and the distal. And this is our final result. Now, it may not be a perfect stent-like result, but obviously uh, we saved the patient from a head-to-toe kind of stenting. Um, you've also heard from Dr. Ho about considering pre-PCI imaging and post-PCI physiology. So I retrospectively did a QFR, which we do have in our lab. And uh, you can see that the results are quite staggering, from a 0 0.24 QFR to post-PCI 0.94. Uh, one interesting subset of lesions that I personally have found to be very useful for DCB is ectatic lesions. This is also a STEMI case, an uh, elderly gentleman who comes in with overall very ectatic vessels, and the, the lesion of interest was the mid-LED. So uh, a quick uh, post-dilation with uh, a quick pre-dilation, I mean, with a 4-0 um, scoreflex DCB, and great angiographic final results. And this would have been a nightmare to stent. I think most people would agree that stenting in, in ectatic lesions and trying to find a suitable landing zone is very difficult. So DCBs have, have proven to be a very valuable tool in this regard. Okay, so now, um, after these few cases, why are we still hesitating sometimes? One thing I hear is, I never seem to get good vessel prep. And this is from the DCB consensus paper. Basically, try and prep lesions the same way that you would for stents. And if anything, I would say you should try and prep them more aggressively. Because if you stent lesions, you always have the choice to progressively post-dilate the stents. But before you actually apply DCB, you need to be completely happy that that's the lumen that you are willing to accept. This is a young patient who presents with an NSTEMI. Um, we, we wanted to tackle the RCA, which was deemed to be the culprit. And you can see that there are two separate lesions in the distal RCA and further down in the, the mid-RPL, which is almost the CTO. So we did the, the smaller lesion, the mid-RPL first, a 2-0 DCB, and after that, also good results. Then we, we turned to tackle the distal RCA uh, just at the bifurcation. So we started with a 2-5, and after the vessel prep, this is the area that we got. Okay, again, a quick poll. Who's happy with this result? Would you proceed to DCB? Okay, some would. Who's not happy? Who would say, no, I, I'm not happy with this, I would stand this? Okay, so some. So what we did was we decided to IVERS, and it turns out that the RPL is a 4 row vessel, and so we severely underestimated this angiographically. Um, I don't think anyone on the offset without imaging would take a 3-5, to the RPL, which is what we did in this case. And you can see the final result is a lot more different. So just to compare before and after with only angio guidance versus post imaging, it's a lot more lumen gain. So if you don't seem to get good vessel prep, make sure that we've given it a sincere attempt. And next time, consider using imaging, because that often tells us a lot that, that we can't see on the angiogram. And that's really not, not something uh, that has to do with the operator. It's just the limitations of the modality of angiography. The next concern. OK, so I want to dilate, but I don't want to dilate too much, because if I dilate too much, I have to do bailout stenting. This is a case of STEMI, uh, N-STEMI that, that we had done. The patient had already done the RCA and came, comes for a stage to the LED, the mid-LED here. So again, IVUS some fibrocalcific plugs, a bit more calcium this time than the previous cases, uh, did a scoreflex 2.5 and a 3.5 to the prox. Pretty good result that we were happy to accept. So we did a DCB 2.75 and then a 4.0 in the proximal vessel, which was all uh, sized appropriately according to the IVUS. 
Now, what we got post DCB was this. So some hints of dissection in the mid LED may be okay, but when we took more views, this is what we saw. So the aerial cranial view, you see a long dissection, and on the collar view, um, well, I think different people have different risk appetites. There might be some people here who are more courageous, uh, who would say, you're happy to leave this. Um, I will admit that I personally wasn't very happy to, to accept this. So we proceeded to do bailout stenting. Um, we did the IVERS, and, and we see that there are actually two dissection flaps which corresponded to the calcific region. So perhaps not entirely surprising. Now, I promise you this is the only picture of a stand that you're going to see for this presentation. Um, but really, the point I wanted to bring across is that it's not a crime to do, to do um, a bailout stenting. And I would say that it is an essential skill to be able to recognize when to do bailout stenting. And stents and DCBs should actually be complementary. They're not mutually exclusive. Um, so, yeah. So finally, some people say, I'm afraid of vessel closure after DCB. I sleep better at night after stenting. How true is this? This is a big registry from a um, Paclitaxel DCB. And you can see at the bottom that the, the event rate of target vessel closure is 0.1%. That's very low. How about stents? This is a large meta-analysis of more than 200,000 patients done in the era of modern DES. Um, the total stent thrombosis rate at the end of about two years is 2.4%. So while we're not uh, comparing a, a direct cohort comparison, it's safe to say that the DCB rate closure is very low, and if anything, it's definitely not, as uh, it's definitely not any higher than stents. And I'm going to wrap up with the last case. Um, this is a patient who had a previous DCB to two different vessels two years ago and now comes for typical symptoms of angina. So there was obviously concern about uh, whether there were any issues with the previous DCB. So let's go back in time and revisit what happened in 2021 because that's very relevant. This patient actually presented with an out-of-hospital collapse with a posterior STEMI and actually had an occlusion of a large circumflex. So after uh, prying the vessel open, the 2.5, uh, it's actually a very torturous vessel with a bifurcation lesion, which we actually successfully did a DCB, a 3.0 DCB, and pretty okay results. And so the patient went to the ward and had good recovery. Subsequently, when the patient was doing rehab, um, it was quite a prolonged stay because it was a collapsed patient. The patient actually complained of chest pain, so we brought the patient back for a relook. Sirk was doing fine. Again, we see type B dissection, which was uh, healing, and we left it alone. And the target was deemed to be this um, side branch disease, uh, which was left alone at the outset. So we did another DCB to the diagonal, also with fairly acceptable angiography results. So that was in 2021. So what might have happened now? Is it the SERP? Is it the diagonal? Is it something new? Is it nothing? So, looks fine. Diagonal, it's fine. RCA is the same. So it turned out that it was a de novo disease progression of the, the LED, which we see clear, more clearly on um, separate views. We confirmed it with an FFR, which was 0 0.66, so we proceeded to do DCB to the LED. Imaging guidance, large vessel, 4.0, morphology, fibrous, likely to yield. So again, scoring balloons, DCB, and this is our final result. So um, just for fun, we did a post uh, PCI IVERS. Uh, I know this is not routinely done, but uh, I thought it would be just fun to show. So this is a before and after, and I'm going to play it. It's been timed to show you the same um, cuts of the vessel. Randall, perhaps uh, we can uh, wrap up your presentation, yeah. okay. please. Thank you. So the MLA increased from three to nine. And this is my last case. So if you're afraid of vessel closure, the truth is the rate of vessel closure is very low. And so I'm going to conclude by very quickly saying that um, the, there are some challenges in DCB, but uh, if, if you are concerned about optimal lesion preparation, the need for bailout stenting, and the fear of post-vessel closure, these fears are largely unfounded. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, so, so we'll open uh, for discussion. Uh, there are some questions, but I, I want us to make sure that the session, if you as much as you can, I know it's very short to be clear about how we're going to use it because that's on a practical basis. 
and secondly, to clear some of the thoughts, because I'm going to ask my good friend's uh, opinion afterwards, uh, Michael, so you're going to have to be prepared to answer, and, and your thoughts on terms of wanting the, the place of using DCB at this point in time. So let me ask firstly, Wan. Wan Azman is one of the writers, in, in fact, the main writer for the International Consensus uh, Group Statement. So I, I just want to ask you, because what is important really is in the lesion preparation, isn't it? Yeah. How, how would you advise people? Because, you know, you don't want to, number one, uh, have a higher risk of restenosis, and number two, very importantly, you don't want to try to convert uh, to a, a stand. Uh, otherwise, it's going to kill the, you know, the confidence of people. So what is your advice in terms of preparing the vessel? Okay, in the international consensus, we wrote that uh, lesion preparation, the key, is the key to the success of the CBA procedure. So what's different between the different consensus and the international consensus? Uh, in the past, uh, the German consensus and also the Asian Pacific consensus, they're about a little bit conservative about using the balloon, the pre dilatation balloon. They tend to use a, a smaller balloon, 0 0.8 to 1, or in the Asian consensus, 0 0.9 to 1. But in our inter international consensus, which is 1 to 1, the, the balloon size is 1 to 1. The, the reason for that, we want to have optimal, optimal vessel preparation so that uh, there'll be a better drug delivery to the vessel wall, a better drug delivery to the vessel, vessel wall, uh, and also a long-term result. Because the predictor for long-term result is MLD, post-balloon dilatation. You get a good MLD, then your long-term result will be good. The other thing we want, I want to also to highlight here that the, the, use, the decision to use DCB after vessel preparation is the angiographic, uh, what you call, criteria. There is a Timitri flow, Timitri flow, and residual stenosis of uh, less than 30% and dissection of type 1 and 2. Not imaging, we're not using imaging because in the real world, uh, the use of imaging is very low, particularly in our in the Malaysian, the use of IVERS is less than 5%. So this is a uh, one to encourage people to use DCB in the real world setting so that the criteria is based on geographic criteria. So the other thing that we want to also to highlight is that DCB is a, uh, uh, the, the drug cotabulin to, to deliver the drug. It's not a pre dilatation balloon. So you, you prepare the vessel well, very well, well, and then when you use the DCB, you use that nominal pressure. Nominal pressure. Just to deliver, not like pre dilatation uh, uh, balloon. You do not go with the DCB of 10, 12, or higher uh, pressure uh, to, uh, uh, to pre dilate further uh, the, the lesion. So I think, uh, the, as you can see from the two, just, I just want to summarize here, from the two cases that, that have been presented, they use DCB, you simplify complex lesion to make the, the procedure more simpler. Uh, for example, uh, the CTO is always complex in the Asian because it's very long, small, you don't know where to, where to stand, and most of the time we don't, know, we don't use IVERS, you don't know. So DCB is uh, uh, appropriate to use, where after we use DCB, then uh, later on, we bring back the patient, we can see what you call positive gain, vessel gain. The vessel become bigger, and if we need to stand, we can use only a short stand rather than long standing. It's merely a complex lesion. So when you use DCB, you simplify the procedure. The only thing is to learn, to learn vessel preparation. That need a learning curve to learn to prepare the vessel well. And then after, after preparing the vessel, is to learn, to accept, when to accept the result and to DCB because you don't want to come. People always fear of uh, acute vessel closure and uh, not getting a, what you call a very stand-like result after DCB preparation. So when you prepare, most of the time, I, I use uh, nowadays, I use an NC balloon and I go one-to-one -one vessel preparation. I do not go very high, but I tend to be a little bit longer. I leave the, the, the balloon a little bit longer. And sometimes I also tend to use more scoring balloon because they also study to show that scoring balloon, you get better MIT. That okay, thank you very much. Hiwa, anything to add on a practical basis? I think uh, Dr. Wan Asman has covered uh, most of it. I think uh, lesion preparation is key. I think you need a lot of patience. Uh, you know, sometimes it's easier to put in a stand and post dilate. But with lesion preparation, sometimes you have a lot of steps. You know, you keep uh, using different balloons. And uh, patience is key. I think the, the important thing is, uh, for us, I think in Tatoxin, we are increasingly using imaging because I think uh, what Randall has showed is that we understand what is the plug morphology. Uh. 
So from my ex our experience, if you have a fibrous plug, uh, it tends to respond a bit better to uh, balloon angioplasty with your lesion preparation, and and you do get a, a, a stand-like result. And we, we have confidence to leave uh, certain things behind, and also uh, you choose the appropriate size balloons. Yeah. Okay, Paul, I just want to ask you, yep. if you have, uh, let's say, a dissection, and you know, your concern, how do you, uh, you know, uh, manage that in the sense that uh, do you convert to uh, stenting or do you want to wait first? How do you do that in the practical set in your setting? I think I think the international guideline also cover that. Okay, you know, uh, one Asman just now have given a very uh, detailed description. You know, you really need to look and know your dissection grade well. I think the uh, A and B are okay. Uh, above C is a bit more borderline. But sometimes if you're not sure, um, often people who does DCB a lot, you notice that they, they finish the final angiogram, but they, the final angiogram is not the final angiogram. They actually kept the patient in the, on the table for a little bit longer and redo another picture in about 10 minutes, 15 minutes, just to see if the TME free flow is still okay. So this also give you extra confidence uh, of, of it. So if you've got TME free flow, the dissection grade is no more than A and B, pretty okay. If it's C, that is where the debate is. Okay, but sticking to the, uh, you know, the, the fellows who are, you know, venturing to the novo lesion, I would suggest maybe stick with type A and B dissection only. Timmy free flow, residual stenosis of less than 30%, you're okay. Okay. I mean, there's a question yeah. on... Uh, maybe maybe yeah. we should, you know, uh, you know, I encourage you to put uh, questions on the apps, but there are a couple of questions maybe, uh, you know, can I, can I get uh, Wasan involved? Um, two questions. Um, one is... How long do we have to give the APT after DCB? So, you know, what, what, what's your thoughts, especially the, you're doing all these complex cases? <laughs> yes, thank you for our very nice uh, our questions. I think for, for me, our, when I use a DEB, I use the DAP also, but just only one or two weeks. If you want to go on for surgery or something like that, we, we can do like only one or two weeks and then stop. Uh, DAPT and then go for surgery. Uh, but usually, uh, if we don't want to go for surgery, I, I will use about one month for the, for the DAP. Yeah, at least you, you can, if you use DCB per se alone, then you know that you can actually shorten your, uh, this, uh, your DAPT. Michael, I did ask you, I'm sorry to keep you on the spot, but you know, to give an idea from your point of view of how you, uh, the, the use of DCB and thoughts on it, and then we can ask the, our panelists on the where, uh, the situations that you will use DCB at this current point in time. Rosalie, thank, thank you very much for allowing me to give a little word on that topic. Um, if we look back in history and, and, and reconsider where we are today, we have to say that we have now more than 30 years experience in implanting stents. We made huge, huge improvements with the stents. And when we look at the guidelines independently, which one you look at, the drug eluting stent implantation is the choice to go for with the 1A indication. Why are we now looking for something different uh, and more or less going back to the times before we had the stent? We know that the drug eluting stents, they create over time events. So there is not the event curve flattening out over time. It is consistently increasing by about 1.5 to 2% event rate per year. Now, if you are 80 years old, that doesn't play a role for you. If you are 50 years old or 60 years old and have two decades of life expectancy, that plays a role. Now, the whole thing is now back again. Get rid of any permanent implant implant free artery this is the way to go for again when we look at the guidelines there's a very clear statement where dcb plays a role it is in instant restenosis where there is a failure of the drug eluting stent because of interval hyperplasia but now we are expanding to the field of non-stented vessel segments you have seen nice cases here the only thing i say is when you look at history in interventional cardiology we always did extremely well conducted prospective randomized trials and based on the results of these randomized trials we got our recommendation that entered the guidelines now if you look how long we have dcbs available unfortunately these huge randomized trials 
are lacking today, apart from the indication of the instant restenosis. So, my advice is, Rosli, you are doing that. Do these trials, select the real competition. So I'm not talking about vessels significantly beyond 2.0 millimeter, because very difficult that these lesions will convert into significant clinical endpoints. We are talking about the large vessels you have seen there. We need these well-conducted randomized trials. We need to see whether there will be a non-inferiority against uh, drug-eluting stents. This is, for at least from my point of perspective, the most likely scenario that could happen. I don't believe that we're going to have a superiority. If a superiority, maybe 10 years or later, if the DCB can show that you have this kind of flattening of event curve. But we also, and this is the most important thing, we also should look at health economical data because what we have seen here to do a very good lesion preparation, imaging guided, DCB on top, I have to consider that in my country a DCB is five times as expensive as a drug eluting stent. So this has to be taken into consideration as well. So if we have a nice trial that shows non-inferiority, but the device is five times as expensive as standard of care, how can we integrate that into our healthcare system? This question in parallel needs to be answered by these trials. Right. And that is why I want to encourage people to do the same correct way as we have done always in interventional cardiology, do the randomized trials, right. get the data out of that, and not only present occasional right. case scenarios, which most of the time turn out to be very nice. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. So I, I think, uh, as we say, the, the, uh, the beauty about this technology, and we're very hopeful because uh, we are all DCB users here. And, uh, and in my own practice, 70% of patients will receive a DCB, even though uh, this, uh, the, uh, you know, DCB is mainly in hybrid fashion. But leaving nothing behind, making the complex procedure simpler in the sense of a shorter stand because stand is something which is foreign, is something very attractive. And we, as mentioned yesterday, we're going to have a reverse study uh, by B. Brown and 1,425, a number of people over here are actually uh, 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 investigators in the studies, Korea, Taiwan, Malaysia, and uh, Singapore. And we hope that to have an answer in de novo lesions to 3.0 to 4.0, whether it's going to be non-inferior with any DS. Uh, I know that I'm going to take, give me about two minutes time, please. Uh, just short, what's the uh, name, Hiwa, your indications of DCB right now, all lesions, short. For me, I think the ISR, small vessels, bifurcation, diffuse disease, uh, hybriding risk and ACS. One? Yeah, I think the only thing that uh, I did not use uh, DCB is uh, in the left main mm. and only a uh, single vessel which is pattern. All right, uh, the rest uh, I out. Consider DCB. <laughs> yes, in Thailand, we still cannot reimburse the DEB. So we strictly uh, use in the instant bridge stenosis and small vessels. But I uh, use sometimes with the hybriding risk as well. Right. Paul, indications and closing remarks? Okay, I, I think, you know, we know ISR is done and dusted. You know, nobody talk about it. So today's focus is largely on de novo. And I think the closing remarks have to be the key statement here is lesion preparation is key. Okay, and lesion preparation, you know, all the panel expertise have shared with you is you know, know the vessel dissection grade, know the residual grade, know the testimetry flow, have the courage to explore this uh, new technique. And, and obviously it's something that will benefit your patient because you can see in some beautiful cases shown today by our speakers. You know, it was shown in ACS, shown in high bleeding risk patients, calcified patients, calcified lesions, CTO, and the follow-up angiograms are really, you know, you really need to see and how good the result can be. So leaving nothing behind, give the blood vessels a chance and without caging it. So for that, I think we thank everyone. I know it's really impressive. So many people attended this session. You know, see there's so much courage and positive vibes in DCB in Asia. Okay, so uh, thank, thank you, you to all and enjoy the rest of the Congress. Thank you. Thank you.